Part 3 Endeavour Trapped between the plains of what was and what could be, the horses slip their reins and life runs scarily through. Not everything is meant to be, and endings can come too soon. That doesn't mean I didn't want to be free, that I will never stop missing you. The watcher cries through his lowering health. I want to rise above it and nurture myself. But time won't stand still while you recover. Instead, it pushes you headlong into the life of another. Hybrid out power ballad. By now, I was actively looking forward to my Lizzie visit, but the next day things weren't quite as peaceful and contented, as if the universe had decided to punish us for things going so well till now. It started when I woke to watch the news to see what was being said about Lizzie's planet. What I saw was not good, even before we got to the main story. The backup coal supply our country was using, because the backup gas supply had run out, had also collapsed, and there is a waiting list for the last drops of oil from around the world that were now being sold at an exorbitant price that meant taxes had been raised on everything. The electricity supply from nuclear power stations was also under threat after lack of fuel had caused the fire at our biggest plant. This wasn't just true of our country either. Apparently there was an international shortage as levels were smaller than anyone had realised. At this rate humanity only had a few more years to live before everything ran out completely. As if in agreement, the lights had flickered and died off in my room five times already that day. And every time the power died, it was accompanied by a cacophony of alarms that made it sound as if the whole planet was dying and trying to warn us. I desperately longed for some vigorous free sunlight. The news said that the only sensible thing for humanity to do would be to conserve its existing power supplies and put its weight into finding other more reliable sources and still our politicians were dithering and delaying over the solar panels that had staved off the worst of it in other more far-sighted lands, with light the only means to save us all from this darkness. Somehow though, some bright spark had had a bright idea, and it was one that chilled me to the bone. This planet that had been discovered with intelligent life, surely that had materials that could be plundered? For a moment I thought they meant purely knowledge, and vowed to ask Lizzie more information about how Ziggurus Free harnessed their trilogy of sun's rays into a workable system that we could copy. Not that I thought she'd know, not being part of the science clan, but there might have been some clue I could pass on anonymously to some source somewhere. But no. With a plunging heart I realised that our so-called experts were seriously talking about sending in an invasion fleet and either plundering these resources, which I was sure the Clandisprods would have gladly given, or, if the Clandisprods refused, colonising their planet altogether in the name of a human race. Somehow it was this invasion, rather than the impending catastrophe, that united all the world leaders and made them act as one. Despite past differences that went back decades and had nearly started wars, our leaders were already discussing with neighbouring countries how to work together to stop a race I knew to be largely peaceful and pulling resources together they had been developing in secret. The spacecraft that could fly on to next to no fuel. Why weren't we adapting that for ourselves? It would have benefited us so much. The missiles ready to strike at the heart of Ziggurus free if they refused. The mass coordinated armed forces waiting for the word to strike. Pirates, that's what we were reduced to now. For all their evolution, mankind was still playing at being pirates and missing the bigger picture of what having new neighbours in space could have meant for us all. Mankind had devolved from being the boffin of the intergalactic class, ahead of his peers as he handed in his technological homework, to the school bully who had no idea how things worked, but saw someone else with something he wanted and vowed to get it. As far as I could see, nobody had even considered making contact and negotiating first, and I knew well how much there was to learn and gain from these people, if only they think to ask. We couldn't afford to throw this chance away for our planet's sake, but somehow that's what we were being conned into doing. As I expected, Lizzie was horrified when she joined me, and saw the news coverage herself. But, 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 she spluttered, what good would it do your species anyway? You have everything we've got, except the two extra suns. Even one sunbow surely would do something if you used it for energy properly. And you have an important resource we don't have, all that water just sitting there, doing nothing but getting wetter. You have ready-made energy that falls from the sky. 
What on earth, all Ziggur is free, do we do? I don't know, but that is not the answer. Turn the television off, Enwin. Maybe it would give us a few extra vital seconds before we send their missiles to my home. She was joking, I think, but for the first time there was no lightness behind the mischief. I'd never heard Lizzie so angry. It's not their fault, I plead. We grew up too fast, inventing things before we were quite ready no to know how to use them. Did your species not go through a similar evolution? No, said Lizzie sparingly. We took to the caves to save on the planet's resources early on. We always made sure that we shared, even in the bad old days when the family groups were in open competition with each other and guaranteed everyone enough sunshine fuel to get by. We never needed any other fuel. We don't even have a word for nuclear, but this telepathy thing seems to give me a vague understanding of what you mean. It sounds terrifying in the extreme. What if it goes wrong? It frequently does, I sigh, remembering, then blocking memories of explosions and burnt bodies, a long-term sky-high cancer rate so as not to scare her. This is horrible, devastating, so much cruelty, she said. My people may not have been that kind, least of all to me, but they were noble and intelligent and right about so many things. I can't believe that I have just been watching another alien race sit calmly and talk about wiping us out, as if their own kind is any better, when they are clearly not. And I feel so hopeless that there's nothing I can do. I go to comfort her, putting my arms mentally around her, the way I always did, but she shrugged them off. No, don't you see? You are the enemy now. I have to start treating you like that. What was I thinking even being in someone's head on this planet? All I see on Earth is self-inflicted misery. You all br brought this on yourselves. All of you. But Lizzie, what can us masses do? We don't have a society like yours where everyone has a say and things are planned for the good of everyone. We have a small powerful few in charge and the rest of us have no control over what they do. That's your problem, not ours, she cries. Did you all truly not see this coming? Resources don't grow small overnight in one go. And how did these huge companies get so powerful if not for all of you buying from them? I had no answer for that. Instead, I said, we are not all like that. Humanity isn't all bad. You're not the one who has a missile about to be pointed straight at them. I'm sorry. Well, so am I. I had never seen anyone this angry, never mind someone usually so calm, patient and kind. What made it worse was that, in her chaos and emotion, Lizzie was plainly losing control of how to use the teleportal to put her thoughts quietly into my head, so that every word she said came off as shouting, and she waved all four of her arms in such a way that it seemed as if she was wrapping them on the inside of my head. Please, I gasped as the motion sickness made the room grow fuzzy and distant, stop, for my sake. Oh, just as your planet stopped for our sakes. I can't believe I was taken in for so long because of a set of pretty alien eyes. And unlike some species out there, you only have one pair. Just then the light suddenly went out without warning. Not again, I gasped to Lizzie. The power will be back on soon if it's like the last few times. Lizzie? There was no response, which was odd enough in itself. But what made everything worse was a growing sense of emptiness inside my head with no sign of her trying to fight her way back in. Surely she couldn't have taken my comments that much to heart. However, there was much about Clandesprod society I didn't know. Maybe this was an overreaction only in my culture rather than the Clandesprod one, and her disappearing was a correct response to someone being rude to you on her world. Lizzie, if you can hear me, I'm sorry, I yell, only too aware of how ridiculous I sound, shouting to myself in the middle of a pitch black house. I strain and struggle to hear for any signs of her, keep starting whenever I think I can feel her in my brain, only to realise that it is just my own uneasy thoughts shiggling around by themselves. There was no more communication from Lizzie that night, and I began to fear that I might never be again. Drifting in and out of an uneasy sleep that night, I begin to wonder, did I cause all this? Did I do something wrong? Is she all right? Did something happen to her? And then a more worrying thought strikes me. Does she think that I am doing exactly the same to her and cutting her off? That's the worst of having an imaginary friend from an alien planet, I tell myself. There's no way to get them on the phone and nowhere to send a letter. 
I would even pay an astronomical bill about now to talk to her and put things right. I decide she might be able to at least see me, so eventually I haul myself up from bed, fumble my way downstairs in the dark and grab a candle. Writing by the light of it, I write, I'm sorry, Lizzie. Please come back. I miss you so much. However, I am down to my last candle, still left over from our romantic night, and I barely get that far through my sentence before the one light I have in my life flickers and dies, leaving me trapped again in the darkness. And this time it really was darkness, as the power remained obstinately shut off permanently this time, as if the whole planet was sulking. Soon all my head could hear were those alarms sounding off outside, and I longed instead to drown them out and replace them with the sound of the only person who could ever make me feel better. Instead, weary and sorry, and with the temperature quickly dropping, after a few aimless hours of waiting, I crawled off back to bed. Enwin, I'm sorry, I... But before I can say any more, I am back in the teleportal room, dimly aware that the teleportal machine has caught fire and there is smoke everywhere. I have the strange brief sensation of being back amongst all the glistening light again, but through a veil this time, as the smoke wraps itself around the light, I'm an inky blackness as the world around me fades and I lose consciousness. Despite the hopelessness of the situation, I try to broadcast my last thoughts anyway. Enwin, I'm sorry Enwin, please come back. I miss you so much. As I come round with a groan, I become dimly aware of a group of three lights surrounding me as I lie back in my room. It may have been a hallucination, but even without their faces, I can tell that their expressions are a look of disgust and pity. I am so used to these feelings at home, but never here before, not in heaven. What did I do? It looks as if a teleportal machine she uses said one of the voices. That will teach you to sneak into rooms with a lot of tea, says another crossly. So many rules for us, I'm not sure you should be up here at all. But Enwin, I meant to be talking to Enwin. You told me to, I say, aware of how lame I sound. It will take a very long time to form this machine to fix it, snaps the second voice. It's all right, says a third voice. Kind of than the others. It was us who made this. We sent it to the wrong room by accident. It is too early for anyone here to be talking to you yet. It must have been very hard for you to communicate. I am amazed you have anything worth talking about for such a primitive life from you. They're not primitive, I croak. Barking mad a lot of them, easily led as a rule, and most often concerned with all the wrong things, but they're not a bad people. And even the worst races have some good. We clandestrods are far from perfect. A very lovely speech, says the first voice, while the second snorts in derision. But I am afraid that that's not really true. You won't be aware of it, but right now, at this very minute, the humans are preparing to point a missile at the planet. I know, I croak. Self-defence. Humans are such jumpy characters, but they are not all like that. So if we were to rewind the teleportal recording voice and study your last communication, it would be a truly happy one full of flowers and rainbows and unicorns and dead balls and algebra. Well, not the last part of the last one, but any time before that, I had feebly. I think the human found a way to blow up a teleportal device to stop the spying one the humans are really up to. How could he? The teleportal is up here, I cry. Humans are sneaky, they could find a way. I wonder if we look back in a telltale teleport and we might find evidence of telepathy working the other way of the human seeing into this world. Yes, we tried it, but it was a failure, and when collapsed. That's what he wanted you to think. Maybe he made me lose consciousness too. No, no, no. I'm getting really distressed now. Well, whatever the cause, you wouldn't be able to talk again for a while anyway, said the third voice. When you are restless, you will pay you with the bell that I meant to be with instead. And it's decided. That's the first voice. And they walk off, leaving me desolate and empty without Enwin. It was only then too that I realised the nagging feeling of uneasiness that had been in my mind for so long had actually been an answer. And I kicked myself for not thinking of it earlier. 
those mysterious wires? Do they have something to do with the nasty of the three voices? If so, could I go back to the trio and safely ask about them, or would that just get me into more trouble? I had to get one of the other two voices alone somehow, or sneak back into the room to take a look. Well, I figured, there's no time like the present. Before I can do that, though, my suddenly empty head, still woozy from the shock and full of smoke, I stumble and have to sit down. Oh, Enwin, what will become of us now? It frequently does, I sigh, remembering, then blocking memories of explosions and burnt bodies, a long-term sky-high cancer rate so as not to scare her. This is horrible, devastating, so much cruelty, she said. My people may not have been that kind, least of all to me, but they were noble and intelligent and right about so many things. I can't believe that I have just been watching another alien race sit calmly and talk about wiping us out, as if their own kind is any better, when they are clearly not. And I feel so hopeless that there's nothing I can do. I go to comfort her, putting my arms mentally around her, the way I always did, but she shrugged them off. No, don't you see? You are the enemy now. I have to start treating you like that. What was I thinking, even being in someone's head on this planet? All I see on Earth is self-inflicted misery. You all br brought this on yourselves. All of you. But Lizzie, what can us masses do? We don't have a society like yours where everyone has a say and things are planned for the good of everyone. We have a small, powerful few in charge and the rest of us have no control over what they do. That's your problem, not ours, she cries. Did you all truly not see this coming? Resources don't grow small overnight in one go. And how did these huge companies get so powerful if not for all of you buying from them? I had no answer for that. Instead, I said, we are not all like that. Humanity isn't all bad. You're not the one who has a missile about to be pointed straight at them. I'm sorry. Well, so am I. I had never seen anyone this angry, never mind someone usually so calm, patient and kind. What made it worse was that, in her chaos and emotion, Lizzie was plainly losing control of how to use the teleportal to put her thoughts quietly into my head, so that every word she said came off as shouting, and she waved all four of her arms in such a way that it seemed as if she was wrapping them on the inside of my head. Please, I gasped as the motion sickness made the room grow fuzzy and distant, stop, for my sake. Oh, just as your planet stopped for our sakes. I can't believe I was taken in for so long because of a set of pretty alien eyes. And unlike some species out there, you only have one pair. Just then the light suddenly went out without warning. Not again, I gasped to Lizzie. The power will be back on soon if it's like the last few times. Lizzie? There was no response, which was odd enough in itself. But what made everything worse was a growing sense of emptiness inside my head with no sign of her trying to fight her way back in. Surely she couldn't have taken my comments that much to heart. However, there was much about Clandesprod society I didn't know. Maybe this was an overreaction only in my culture rather than the Clandesprod one, and her disappearing was a correct response to someone being rude to you on her world. Lizzie, if you can hear me, I'm sorry, I yell, only too aware of how ridiculous I sound, shouting to myself in the middle of a pitch black house. I strain and struggle to hear for any signs of her, keep starting whenever I think I can feel her in my brain, only to realise that it is just my own uneasy thoughts shiggling around by themselves. There was no more communication from Lizzie that night, and I began to fear that I might never be again. Drifting in and out of an uneasy sleep that night, I begin to wonder, did I cause all this? Did I do something wrong? Is she all right? Did something happen to her? And then a more worrying thought strikes me. Does she think that I am doing exactly the same to her and cutting her off? That's the worst of having an imaginary friend from an alien planet, I tell myself. There's no way to get them on the phone and nowhere to send a letter. I would even pay an astronomical bill about now to talk to her and put things right. I decide she might be able to at least see me, so eventually I haul myself up from bed, fumble my way downstairs in the dark and grab a candle. Writing by the light of it, I write, I'm sorry, Lizzie. Please come back. I miss you so much. However, I am down to my last candle, still left over from our romantic night, and I barely get that far through my sentence 
and for the one light I have in my life flickers and dies, leaving me trapped again in the darkness. And this time it really was darkness, as the power remained obstinately shut off permanently this time, as if the whole planet was sulking. Soon all my head could hear were those alarms sounding off outside, and I longed instead to drown them out and replace them with the sound of the only person who could ever make me feel better. Instead, weary and sorry, and with the temperature quickly dropping, after a few aimless hours of waiting, I crawled off back to bed. Enwin, I'm sorry, I... But before I can say any more, I am back in the teleportal room, dimly aware that the teleportal machine has caught fire, and there is smoke everywhere. I have the strange brief sensation of being back amongst all the glistening light again, but through a veil this time, as the smoke wraps itself around the light, I'm an inky blackness as the world around me fades and I lose consciousness. Despite the hopelessness of the situation, I try to broadcast my last thoughts anyway. Enwin, I'm sorry Enwin, please come back. I miss you so much. As I come round with a groan, I become dimly aware of a group of three lights surrounding me as I lie back in my room. It may have been a hallucination, but even without their faces, I can tell that their expressions are a look of disgust and pity. I am so used to these feelings at home, but never here before, not in heaven. What did I do? It looks as if a teleportal machine uses a uh, fluid fuse, said one of the voices. That will teach you to sneak into rooms with a lot of tea, says another crossly. So many rooms for us, I'm not sure you should be up here at all. But Enwin, I meant to be talking to Enwin. You told me to, I say, aware of how lame I sound. It will take a very long time to form this machine to fix it, snaps the second voice. It's all right, President, says a third voice, kinder than the others. It was us who made this. We sent it to the wrong room by accident. It is too early for anyone here to be talked to or yet. It must have been very hard for you to communicate. I am amazed you have anything worth talking about for such a primitive life for you. They're not primitive, I croak, barking mad a lot of them, easily led as a rule, and most often concerned with all the wrong things, but they're not a bad people, and even the worst races have some good. We clandestrods are far from perfect. A very lovely speech, says the first voice, while the second snorts in derision. But I am afraid that's not really true. You won't be aware of it, but right now, in this very minute, the humans are preparing to point a missile at the planet. I know, I croak. Self-defence. Humans are such jumpy characters, but they are not all like that. So if we were to rewind the teleportal recording voice and study your last communication, it would be a truly happy one full of flowers and rainbows and unicorns and dead lords and algebras. Well, not the last part of the last one, but any time before that, I had feebly. I think the human found a way to blow up a teleportal device to stop the spying on the humans and really up to it. How could he? The teleportal is up here, I cry. Humans are sneaky, they could find a way. I wonder if we look back in the teleport record and we might find evidence of telepathy working the other way of a human seeing into this world. Yes, we tried it, but it was a failure, and when collapsed. That's what he wanted you to think. Maybe he made me lose consciousness too. No, no, no. I'm getting really distressed now. Well, whatever the cause, you wouldn't be able to talk again for a while anyway, said the third voice. When you are restless, you will pay you with the bell of the and to be within steps. Then it's decided. That's the first voice. And they walk off, leaving me desolate and empty without Enwin. It was only then, too, that I realised the nagging feeling of uneasiness that had been in my mind for so long might actually have been an answer. And I kicked myself for not thinking of it earlier. Those mysterious wires, did they have something to do with the nasty of the three voices? If so, could I go back to the trio and safely ask about them, or would that just get me into more trouble? I had to get one of the other two voices alone somehow, or sneak back into the room to take a look. Well, I figured, there's no time like the present. Before I can do that, though, my suddenly empty head, still woozy from the shock, and full of smoke, I stumble and have to sit down. 
Oh, Enwin, what will become of us now? Why, when they tip my world upside down, did you not fall into my arms? Or have I still to learn that this is not how the world works? We've shared too many smiles for them to turn into frowns, to do each other harm. Too much healing to make each other burn, to cause each other hurt. I only came here to get away, but now my thoughts aren't here, but there. You swallow my nights and slaughter my days with memories of what we used to share. If pain is a way of measuring time until a wound is finally healed, then it will last until you are again mine. I can, I can tell you just how I feel. The future feels so out of my hands, and I'm not entirely sure why. There is peace in seeking separate lands, but we will always share the same sky. Enwin. I hadn't fully realised how much I had come to rely on Lizzie in such a short space of time. Of course there were the usual things you have when you lose the one you love. The shadow of their presence as everything reminds you of them and all their good bits. Their smile, their eyes, their hugs, their kisses, their ability to understand you in a way that few others ever do. I miss Lizzie's humour, the way her brain worked, the way we could happily play in each other's imaginary gardens, the way we finished each other's sentences and how our thought patterns danced a crazy paving tango inside our heads. Lizzie was the first person not to laugh at my jokes. Well, she did. That was why I loved her. But you know what I mean. She was the first to understand my need for them, and didn't just raise her eyebrows at me in that annoying way my own species did. We had learned quickly that we couldn't really argue in the same head. But that was all right, because we soon realised that there was nothing really worth arguing about. The worst that could happen to both of us had already happened, and everything after that seemed minor and slight. Instead we had occasional disagreements, but ones that we could instantly understand what the other one was trying to say, and disagreements aren't the same as arguments at all. Until now. Of all the losses I had endured in my life, this one hit me hardest because Lizzie had felt as if she had been so tailor-made for me. It was more than that, though. There was an extra dimension that came from having someone sharing my mind. Though it was very strange at first, having someone in my head was really useful. Lizzie didn't do it often, but when she lightly shook her head, I knew that what I was about to send in some irate message at three in the morning to some ponced up establishment, keeping money that was rightfully mine away from me, was probably not the way, best way to go about things, though she knew enough to let me write the thing to get it out of my system, just also well enough to stop me sending it. When I was worried about whether I was finding the right words, or was failing in what I was trying to say, she would lightly nod to encourage me, helping me believe that what I was saying was right. When I was anxious or scared, she made me feel better about myself, and showed me that I had a right to feel that way, whatever my fellow humans were up to. When I was depressed, she would hold me up. When I was overjoyous and cocky, she would calm me down. It had felt right suddenly to go through life as part of a pair rather than on my own even for this very short time. The grief was slow to come at first, the way it always does, sliding under the doors of our brain we have locked so that we are able to think at first and wonder to ourselves if it won't actually be as bad as we think, right up until it fills up our hearts and minds with its inky blackness so that it becomes so all-consuming we can't think about anything else. At the beginning there was almost the sense of relief that my life was about to go back to normal, the way it was before, to something I knew and understood. But as the hours, and then the days, and then the weeks ticked by, there began to dawn on me the realisation that I had got it all wrong, that nothing would ever feel normal or right ever again. The worst part was when the grief and my thoughts of Lizzie were pushed back into my long-term memory, as if I wasn't allowed to think of her in the present, because she no longer belonged there, and was now literally a ghost of my memory banks, whose features and character I had to recall, instead of dazzling me daily with her brilliance. With every day that ticked relentlessly on, ignorant of my grief, I felt myself growing more and more distant from the one I loved, without the ability to set myself free from it. And I kept thinking, surely if it was meant to be, somebody or something would have intervened by now. But nobody did. I was on my own, like never before, 
And the worst of it was, this feeling of emptiness, loneliness and despair is exactly what Lizzie had always been so good at dispelling whenever I spoke to her. It was like being hit twice, as a person who could have brought me the greatest solace had this misery been caused by anyone else, was instead the one who had caused it. Or was it simply true that no one had caused it, but far from sulking she was sick, or dead, or both? No, not dead, for she was fat already, but passed on further up the afterlife chain, perhaps. These were heavy subjects to deal with, and they made me feel heavy, physically crushing my head with the weight of loss, while I struggled to hold myself upright. The loss was unendurable, growing by degrees until it went from something I could relegate to a dusty corner of my mind, to an all-consuming fire that burnt me whenever I stopped too long and let in enough time to think about it. Still, there was a part of me that longed to be burnt by the fire, because it was the only link I had to the one who had burnt me. My mind was so empty without Lizzie there, her extra perceptions in my head giving me an added safety net that what I was doing was right, or adding a warning that it wasn't. More than that, though, my heart was empty, and I ached for her with every fibre of my soul. I was already crushed by life, but this was a mortal blow. Could I really get through the rest of my short existence without her? her wisdom, her laughter and her comfort. I was tempted to do what she had done and escape this world altogether, but that went against everything she had ever taught me about ending up there. Better to endeavour, to endure if I could for now, in the hope that a signal would come through in my head again and everything would be put right. But would I even trust that signal if it came? For the first time in my life, I hadn't a clue what to do or how to get out of the situation I had found myself in. Life was very much put on pause for now. I had never felt like this before, but now I felt that if I couldn't share my life with someone, what was the point of living at all? I found myself getting weaker and weaker and doing less and less, until in the end it seems I did very little at all. It's a go-round old snatch conversations in my head, discussions that had floated past me unremembered at the time, now came so clearly, and I clung to them like a life raft in order to stop myself from sinking. Had it all been a dream? Had it all been a ruse? Had it all been for nothing? I wondered for the 500th time that day what had happened to Lizzie and whether it had all been, in every sense of the word, in my head. I longed to know why she didn't contact me anymore. Did she find someone better? Was she with someone from her own kind? Was she sick and tired of my being sick and tired? I wondered over and over again whether she was feeling this too or whether she had been taken over by bug-eyed aliens who were even more bug-eyed than clandestrods, or whether I had, despite the signs, truly meant nothing to her. She was, after all, part of another race entirely. Maybe they just did that sort of thing to their partners. As much as I wanted her to be without pain, oddly it felt less of a burden if she did feel it all too, and we were at least sharing our grief together. A problem with spending most of the day with a voice that only you can hear and can't actually see is that you have no real warning about when it's going to suddenly go or when it will be back again. The problem with spending most of your life with a chronic illness is that your nerves are primed to do the opposite, to long for the moments there is nothing there and to hope that it won't ever come back again, even though you know it is a futile wish. Switching your priorities round as you long to stay conscious long enough to get every second out of this unexpected nice surprise from a life that generally only smacks you in the face, as opposed to what you normally did, which was longing for oblivion. Was if anything a stranger feeling than having a disembodied voice talking in your ear? When would she be back? Should I rest up and get as much sleep as I could so we could talk all night again? Or would the pangs of loneliness be greater later when I needed oblivion more? As I lay there, I considered everything that had happened. I was already sure that Lizzie was one of us, not that I was entirely sure what we were, but there were also all the questions I had never asked about Lizzie's society and how much I still had to learn about the world she lived in. Being stuck in one place, in fairly restrictive isolation, meant that I had grown fascinated with trying to work out how my own world worked, now that you could properly think it over, and see it through so many inherited customs and traditions that the outdated anachronisms and ridiculousness they undoubtedly were. Now I longed all the more to hear about Lizzie's world for comparison. Mostly, though, I just wanted to hear about Lizzie, and whether despite the light years between us, we had both had the same upbringing. 
the same successes, the same failures, the same... But how could we be the same? Before she had joined me, the astronomers on the television had been emphasising the same thing over and over, buried beneath my thoughts. Though we think we have picked up signs of life, we shouldn't expect this world to be like ours. Why would it be? This solar system is so far away that it would probably be unrecognisable in terms of biology and evolution and DNA, and it looked as if they had only one inhabitable world circled by three suns. And what stage of civilization must they be at? They could be at the Stone Age, or advanced beyond us by millennia. But surely if we were that advanced or that old, they would know about us and have come in to destroy us already. Therefore they must be behind us, and ripe for plundering. None of this sounded like the Lizzie I knew, but then I realised to my surprise that I hadn't really seen her, or spoken to her for any real length of time. Though undoubtedly one of the deepest, she was also one of the shortest associations I had ever had with anyone close, and I began asking myself if I had just imagined it all. Maybe I had been simply having another fever without knowing it, and had now recovered. Maybe I had somehow heard some of the news subconsciously and invented my own brand of alien who was just enough like me to understand, but just enough different to be exotic. Maybe she didn't really exist at all. Or maybe she did, but in my haste to become something to someone, I had simply exaggerated all the feelings I had felt being reciprocated. Maybe she had despised me all along and had been waiting to get rid of me all this time. Maybe she had only really wanted to hurt me. Maybe I had accidentally hurt her. Or maybe I was overthinking everything, waiting in the silence and the darkness as my health evaporated from me by the day. I began to get worried, more sure with every ticking of the clock that I had invented her after all, until the point where, almost a day after I'd last heard from her, the momentum strung towards thinking that I had indeed most probably imagined it all. For surely she would have been back by now, and surely she could do better than me. I realised that I really did love her, which was why after a very long time of procrastination, I was finally able to let her go, most likely to better things and greater people than me. I spent the rest of the day assuming that this was what had happened, but excessive loneliness on my part and a dash of illness had come together to create the perfect girl for me, and that I had just been dreaming about her. Well, perfect in all ways except the extra arms and purple skin, maybe, but even that had a certain cuteness about it. I began to believe that I had been stupid to think that such a being could ever exist. Not because I no longer believed in aliens, or the idea of an afterlife, but purely because she had been everything I had ever wanted, and she had been, for all too brief and unlikely a moment, mine. I had obviously made her up after falling asleep to the news of a strange new planet on the television. Good things like her don't happen to people like me, and there is always a catch. I began to think that the catch in this case was that my fevered brain had made the whole thing up before moving towards an even bigger worry. Maybe I was the imaginary being in her head and it was me who didn't exist. That would make sense of why I felt so unreal, lying there in bed struggling to move, as if I was waiting for someone to lure me back into consciousness. Yes, of course, that must be it. I am a character in Liz's head and she's about to call me forth back out of this uncomfortable box and back into reality. A reality that never seemed to come. Eventually I gave up this line of questioning too, when the hunger pang set in, and I began to realise that nobody would have thought to have created that in their brain, or indeed all the lucid memories I carried around with me. Still it all felt so unreal, this real world. It was the one with Lizzie in it that sensible humans didn't believe in, that made the most sense to me. Or maybe I was going mad. Yes, that must be it. The illness had finally coursed through my bones to the point where it had made my brain go crazy and I was talking to myself. Well then, that was okay. I could just let my mind give way to the darkness. No need to fight back anymore. After all, I had nothing. I was truly alone now, even if I hadn't been before, because I knew how it felt to be with someone. There was no chance of ever being able to do anything with my life. Those people who claimed to look down on people like me and begrudged me this tiny cramped space and these minor resources were right after all. I was a waste of everything. Better that I should go mad quietly like this, and that they would find me in weeks to come having died of starvation, or some such thing. At last all this fighting would be all over, and I wouldn't have to suffer any of it anymore. I could just be free, and if Lizzie did exist in heaven, then maybe I'd be able to find her up there. 
But no, that wasn't quite right either. I wasn't mad, but heartbroken, and I have fought too many battles and overcome too many odds just to give in now. I had always been my vow to get out of this bed and escape my shackles one day somehow. If only I could hang on long enough for a cure or a medicine or something that was worth living for. I screamed at the universe that I refused to go under and gleefully lifted the burdens I carried around with me like a duvet. No, I would have to readjust the way I had had to adjust to being sick, only now I was adjusting to a broken heart instead. Maybe too it was for the best, I began thinking, even on the sim science at which she was real. What sort of a life would it have been anyway? We could never do anything more than talk. No hugging, no kissing, not even hand-holding. Not that I'm sure exactly where my hand would fit hers, even if we could. What sort of life did I have to offer a young clandestine rod from here? If she was trapped by death, as she had been telling me, then I was trapped by life, unable to join her, though I oddly envied her and longed too to be a disembodied voice falling into the void, unshackled from this wretched body that did all sorts of things that would be on my control, and still surprised me with its ability to disrupt my world. It was clearly all for the best, as my head knew well. This was no future, no way to live at all, and it was better to forget it had ever happened and move on with my life. And yet my heart was breaking, and that was too big a something to simply ignore. The thought that I would never hear that voice again, that I would never get to see the face that had been dreamily hanging in my subconscious this whole time without properly realising it, the fact that something would have been so positive and brought so much love to my life was now a source of pain whenever I thought of it. All of it was awful. It all seemed so wrong. I was still sure of it, that we had been put together to protect each other, and the fact that we had ended up hurting each other through circumstances beyond our control was just the most painful thought possible. Impractical as it may have been, with Lizzie everything was light. Anything seemed possible, and it seemed as if my life had been in stasis, waiting for this moment to be free. But now there was nothing, and I saw myself for what I was, a dying man who had no one to love, and who was loved by no one, in a cramped and darkened corner of a house, in a cramped and darkened town, in a cramped and darkened country, on a cramped and darkened planet that was growing darker and more cramped by the day, as fuel strikes and climate change and overpopulation echoed round all of us like a death rattle. This species had no future, and while I had always had hope for the better side of my speeches, its perseverance and adaptability would get us out of any problem. For the first time, my hope had died out with them. In the end, though, all that mattered was a single thought. Oh, Lizzie, I hope you are sensing this now. You have no idea how much you were loved. My thoughts went round and round on this, only interrupted by the dying sunset, which took an agonisingly long time to roll over in the sky and forget about the living, as if it was shining its light down on each and every inhabitant of the human race for the last time and bidding us goodbye. Oh, Lizzie, where were you? Who was that figure who walked by your side when the waters ran deep and the sky grew wide? Who do I see out of the corner of my eye? I'll ask no longer to see, never more to cry. As a follower of followers observes the observed and calls out as the ghost of so many separated on empty hollow ears for her words as the learner of learners is educated. All of the paths you ever wanted to take but found were blocked by errors and mistakes, were done by your hand, but not with your heart. We should not be punished just because we're apart. For the warmth of spirit, the warmth of the sun, means stronger times are here, with stronger yet to come. Who is that spirit that still walks by your side, sight and seen, my goodness, my pride? For with her at my centre, with her at my core, a uh, sleeve, we might yet save Ziggurus four, a uh, three. Emwyn and Lizzie, trying to be heard above bombardment, in the factory. This was horrific. If I thought I knew what being alone meant before all this, back when I was on my home planet, that was nothing to how I felt right now. 
then I had felt alone without really knowing what it was like to bond with another person, to feel part of something bigger than myself, besides a community who never even knew I was there. Now, though, I was stranded in this strange place, a whole dimension apart from the one that I loved. It was a failure, not just in my life, but in my death, a guardian angel who couldn't even look after her companion without it going all wrong, and even though I knew it was the teleportal machine that had broken us, I still felt responsible. That had not been the last conversation I'd wanted us to have, and I knew Enwin would be mulling it over. I had tried so hard to help, and be kind, and make a difference, and through reasons I could not control, I had only made everything worse. I had had no right to be trying to help somebody with their life, when I was still smarting through the failure of being able to live mine. Why did I say all these things I didn't mean? Was that the last thing Enwin was going to carry in his mind and heart as a reminder of our time together now, for always? It felt as if someone had taken something I had loved and carelessly scattered it across the floor without asking me, and I couldn't put it back together again. All I could do was watch the remnants of it finally choke and die. I keep thinking back to the awful timing of it all. Oh, Enwin, I cry, alone in my room. I wasn't cross with you, just with your kind. Goodness knows for enough greedy so-and-sos on Ziggurus free. Why else would I have chosen to take my own life and end up here in the first place if my planet was perfect too? Oddly, I found myself considering out of nowhere what consists of a home, as the remorse I felt now was far less for my own planet and all the people I had known than it was for this one alien in this one tiny room I so desperately needed to get a message to. I bitterly regretted everything I had said, I long for forgiveness or closure. None came though, so instead I tried to block out the thoughts and turn to what I could do next. I could plead with the voices to put us back together again. No, that didn't seem very likely somehow, and besides the teleportal was still broken as far as I knew. Plus I didn't want to alert whoever it was who had really broken the equipment. I didn't know if it was my paranoia, but I had seriously begun to wonder if there was a spy in our midst who knew just how close we were becoming and didn't like it. Or why else disrupt our communication? But who would benefit from us no longer talking to each other? Someone who wanted the humans to blow us up, I suppose. But why? It didn't seem to make any sense. But then again, none of us had made any sense since I had died and ended up here. So what else could I do? The other voices we had talked to the other night might be able to get a message out, I suppose. But what if they were prevented from making contact with each other too? I knew the pain of my loss was too much to bear after not much time at all. What would it be like for all the headweds who had been together for years, maybe even weeks? I had to get a message to Enwin somehow. But through who? And then the thought struck me. As much as I didn't want to speak to anyone but Enwin, and as much as I knew I was only being placed with someone else to put me off the scent, what if we could me get a message through to him that way? I still remember the destination code that had shown up in the teleportal machine. 69662477860707 slash 0076 slash 077 slash 46475868363 slash D. Teleportal fans, for once being a librarian with memory and cataloguing skills was proving to be useful. Maybe it was fated after all. Would it somehow allow the person I was with to call up Enwin? I worried too about what had happened up here. If someone had been trying to keep us apart, that meant they didn't want us to do something. But what was it? Making contact with a planet that was about to destroy mine, perhaps. But couldn't being so powerful just stop that happening outright? Well, I wanted to do everything I could to save my planet, and Enwin seemed my best chance as my only contact on Earth. I didn't know quite what we could do, but doing something would surely be better than doing nothing and watching my planet burn. I began to hatch a plan to get word to Enwin somehow, to tell the world about us in any form they could, in the hope that someone would read it and understand what was going on. But even if it had worked, would the spies still be listening in, and would they stop me? Well, I figured, I had nothing to lose, and I was going mad alone with my thoughts after being with Enwin. I surely had to try. Nervously, I walked to the door of my room and opened it, praying that I would see one of the nicer balls of light this time. Now the day is over, and the sails are running short. The time is best to halt a while and re-navigate my thoughts. 
the waiting is as endless as the days that were apart. Through an avalanche of feeling, I have to mend my heart. Enwin. Without Lizzie there to give me reason to get up, and nothing worth listening to except the occasional burst of news through the mass hysteria of the power cuts, which continued to be horrifying, I ended up confined to bed, my get up and go finally gone for good. At first it was only meant as a temporary reprieve from all the emptiness and darkness, as the electricity still hadn't come back on. I had a theory that it was being diverted for the special missiles that were being prepared to send to Ziggurus free, not that the population had been told that, of course. In time, though, it became the only place that felt safe, where I could be ready at a moment's notice to talk if Lizzie came back, and a refuge from all the alarms that were still ringing now and then in the neighbourhood, mournful cries that sounded like the death throes of humanity, or maybe clandest prodigy, I thought guiltily. Mostly, though, I stayed there because it was the only place I could get any light at all, with the stars of the sky flickering gently in the pitch black. It seemed right, yet somehow wrong, but it was the light from Ziggurus Free that burned the strongest in the darkness and brought me the most comfort. In time, I even stopped holding myself off to the job centre. They too would surely have lost all electricity, and even if my income was cut off, I no longer cared. There was no electricity to spend money on anyway, and I had lost interest in eating as my illness grew worse. I had almost forgotten that I was sick with Lizzie there to distract me, but without it the gnawing sensation of being ill woke me up like an angry bear straight out of hibernation. It was there softly at first, like a distant echo of a song I vaguely remembered, but it grew stronger and stronger as the days went on, gnawing at my bones like a rabid wolf as the days went by. In tandem with my grief it became all-consuming to the point where I lost all sense of time and was just lost and trapped in this void that stretched out before me, Endless eons of pain and suffering that came over me in waves. I found myself moving my body, not with my muscles any longer, but with my mind, imagining clawing the walls in desperation to free myself from the pain, hanging by my arms from the tops of the ceiling to stretch the muscles that refused to move, clawing with my fingertips in desperation at breaking through this impenetrable wall of pain in my mind, imaginarily banging my head to try and knock myself out so that these thoughts and feelings would stop. I was so tired too, to the point where I was in fact too tired to make the effort to sleep, and instead would drift endlessly with the tides of the void, sometimes flickering into consciousness as I became self-aware enough to pity myself and what I had become before sinking ever deeper into another wave of impenetrable fog. I could no longer think in this condition, no longer feel, no longer move, and the worst of it all was that instead of becoming scared by it, or willing myself to recover, to move, to get better or vanquish this demon, all I could think about was how little it really mattered, as I actively allowed myself to fade into the darkness. As horrible as I know it to be, I am safe here, and have no memories or thoughts of destroyed planets, or broken hearts. However, as I drifted off to sleep in between the power cuts that were becoming more rapid, I couldn't help feeling guilty that I should have been doing something more. But Lizzie and Ziggurus Free were real. They had to be, but surely even my imagination wasn't that good. There had been several propaganda campaigns citing the dangers they posed to our planet and race. All nonsense, of course, just the sort of spiel people give when they are scared of the unknown without good reason to be, the way they had demonised the sick and the poor in the world already. The one good thing that had come out of all of this was that the Earth had forgone their natural, jingoistic, nationalistic qualities and combined their resources working together for arguably the first real time in a political sense. Unfortunately, the only thing that had brought everyone together was the fear of a common enemy, the idea that we were in a war the other side didn't even know was being fought. The money had been raised through extra taxation that hit the poor hardest, of course, to pay for seven shiny new missiles, all of which could reach their target in a matter of months. Debate had been fierce about whether we should try and make contact with Ziggurus Free first, and give them fair warning, but this had been vetoed as too expensive, and that doing so might have given them enough time to prepare a defence or fire back. Some missile attack it was, with my country nominated as headquarters to assemble the new devices. Well, even if Lizzie was somewhere real and alive, it didn't look as if her planet would be for much longer. 
I felt sick to my stomach, the way I did whenever I heard tales of old colonial expeditions and empires and slavery. To think that my kind were still capable of such primitiveness, that they would willingly destroy civilizations that were not their own, and yet now have the weapons to go further. There we were, ready to plunder the world like pirates all over again, when we should have been heading into space with the nobility of explorers coming in peace. Feeling desperately guilty and ashamed of my race, as well as needing to conserve power with a new taxation programme that hits benefits the hardest, I simply turn the television off and try not to think about it at all. But of course, that was impossible. All I could really think about were the innocent people on a planet about to die at our hands and the suffering I knew it would cause to the one I loved above no other. Oh Lizzie, I asked for the thousandth time that day, where were you? Eventually though, with the heaviest of hearts, I realised that she wasn't going to come back after all. I was going to have to carry this burden of being the only one brain and one heart in the same body, the same way it had been before she had turned up. The days stopped being like one another, coalescing in a fusion of madness, misery and tears, and slowly my life turned back to the way it had been before I had met her. The worst of it was how normal everything seemed, how natural living became. It felt like a betrayal of sorts to everything we had been, and were, as I asked myself, if life was not calmer now, without the emotional roller coaster of being in love. But while my head rejoiced at the newfound silence, my heart was still aching for something or someone to fill it the way it had once been filled. I still kept waking every morning, hoping to have some vague sense of Lizzie in my head again, only to find myself disappointed over and over, until eventually this new scary world of dependence became a new normal, and I learned, finally, to get on with my life. Even so, every now and then, I would find myself thinking of a memory I thought I had long ago filed away, and pining for a time when the world was special, when it had meaning, and when I was not alone. I still remember the destination code that had shown up in the teleportal machine, 69666.247786 slash 007 zip slash 077 slash 46475868363 slash D. Teleportal fans, for once being a librarian with memory and cataloguing skills was proving to be useful. Maybe it was fated after all. Would it somehow allow the person I was with to call up Enwin? I worried too about what had happened up here. If someone had been trying to keep us apart, that meant they didn't want us to do something. But what was it? Making contact with a planet that was about to destroy mine, perhaps. But couldn't being so powerful just stop that happening outright? Well, I wanted to do everything I could to save my planet, and Enwin seemed my best chance as my only contact on Earth. I didn't know quite what we could do, but doing something would surely be better than doing nothing and watching my planet burn. I began to hatch a plan to get word to Enwin somehow, to tell the world about us in any form they could, in the hope that someone would read it and understand what was going on. But even if it had worked, would the spies still be listening in, and would they stop me? Well, I figured, I had nothing to lose, and I was going mad alone with my thoughts after being with Enwin. I surely had to try. Nervously, I walked to the door of my room and opened it, praying that I would see one of the nicer balls of light this time. Now the day is over, and the sails are running short. The time is best to halt a while and re-navigate my thoughts. The waiting is as endless as the days that were apart. Through an avalanche of feeling, I have to mend my heart. Enwin. Without Lizzie there to give me reason to get up, and nothing worth listening to except the occasional burst of news through the mass hysteria of the power cuts, which continued to be horrifying, I ended up confined to bed, my get-up-and-go finally gone for good. At first it was only meant as a temporary reprieve from all the emptiness and darkness, as the electricity still hadn't come back on. I had a theory that it was being diverted for the special missiles that were being prepared to send to Ziggurus free, not that the population had been told that, of course. In time, though, it became the only place that felt safe, where I could be ready at a moment's notice to talk if Lizzie came back, and a refuge from all the alarms that were still ringing now and then in the neighbourhood, mournful cries that sounded like the death throes of humanity, or maybe clandestinity, I thought guiltily. 
Mostly, though, I stayed there because it was the only place I could get any light at all, with the stars of the sky flickering gently in the pitch black. It seemed right, yet somehow wrong, but it was the light from Ziggurus Free that burned the strongest in the darkness and brought me the most comfort. In time, I even stopped holding myself off to the job centre. They too would surely have lost all electricity, and even if my income was cut off, I no longer cared. There was no electricity to spend money on anyway, and I had lost interest in eating as my illness grew worse. I had almost forgotten that I was sick with Lizzie there to distract me, but without it, the gnawing sensation of being ill woke me up like an angry bear straight out of hibernation. It was there softly at first, like a distant echo of a song I vaguely remembered, but it grew stronger and stronger as the days went on, gnawing at my bones like a rabid wolf as the days went by. In tandem with my grief, it became all-consuming to the point where I lost all sense of time and was just lost and trapped in this void that stretched out before me, endless eons of pain and suffering that came over me in waves. I found myself moving my body, not with my muscles any longer, but with my mind, imagining, clawing the walls in desperation to free myself from the pain, hanging by my arms from the tops of the ceiling to stretch the muscles that refused to move, clawing with my fingertips in desperation at breaking through this impenetrable wall of pain in my mind, imaginarily banging my head to try and knock myself out so that these thoughts and feelings would stop. I was so tired too, to the point where I was in fact too tired to make the effort to sleep, and instead would drift endlessly with the tides of the void, sometimes flickering into consciousness, as I became self-aware enough to pity myself and what I had become before sinking ever deeper into another wave of impenetrable fog. I could no longer think in this condition, no longer feel, no longer move, and the worst of it all was that instead of becoming scared by it, or willing myself to recover, to move, to get better or vanquish this demon, all I could think about was how little it really mattered, as I actively allowed myself to fade into the darkness. As horrible as I know it to be, I am safe here, and have no memories or thoughts of destroyed planets, or broken hearts. However, as I drifted off to sleep in between the power cuts that were becoming more rapid, I couldn't help feeling guilty that I should have been doing something more. But Lizzie and Ziggurus Free were real. They had to be, but surely even my imagination wasn't that good. There had been several propaganda campaigns citing the dangers they posed to our planet and race. All nonsense, of course, just the sort of spiel people give when they are scared of the unknown without good reason to be, the way they had demonised the sick and the poor in the world already. The one good thing that had come out of all of this was that the Earth had forgone their natural, jingoistic, nationalistic qualities and combined their resources, working together for arguably the first real time in a political sense. Unfortunately, the only thing that had brought everyone together was the fear of a common enemy, the idea that we were in a war the other side didn't even know was being fought. The money had been raised through extra taxation that hit the poor hardest, of course, to pay for seven shiny new missiles, all of which could reach their target in a matter of months. Debate had been fierce about whether we should try and make contact with Ziggurus Free first and give them fair warning, but this had been vetoed as too expensive, and that doing so might have given them enough time to prepare a defence or fire back. Some missile attack it was, with my country nominated as headquarters to assemble the new devices. Well, even if Lizzie was somewhere real and alive, it didn't look as if her planet would be for much longer. I felt sick to my stomach, the way I did whenever I heard tales of old colonial expeditions and empires and slavery. To think that my kind were still capable of such primitiveness, that they would willingly destroy civilizations that were not their own, and yet now have the weapons to go further. There we were, ready to plunder the world like pirates all over again, and we should have been heading into space with the nobility of explorers coming in peace. Feeling desperately guilty and ashamed of my race, as well as needing to conserve power with a new taxation programme that hits benefits the hardest, I simply turn the television off and try not to think about it at all. But of course, that was impossible. All I could really think about were the innocent people on a planet about to die at our hands and the suffering I knew it would cause to the one I loved above no other. Oh Lizzie, I asked for the thousandth time that day, where were you? Eventually though, with the heaviest of hearts, 
I realised that she wasn't going to come back after all. I was going to have to carry this burden of being only one brain and one heart in the same body, the same way it had been before she had turned up. The days stopped being like one another, coalescing in a fusion of madness, misery and tears, and slowly my life turned back to the way it had been before I had met her. The worst of it was how normal everything seemed, how natural living became. It felt like a betrayal of sorts to everything we had been, and were, as I asked myself, if life was not calmer now, without the emotional roller coaster of being in love. But while my head rejoiced of a newfound silence, my heart was still aching for something, or someone, to fill it, the way it had once been filled. I still kept waking every morning, hoping to have some vague sense of Lizzie in my head again, only to find myself disappointed over and over, until eventually this new scary world of dependence became a new normal, and I learned, finally, to get on with my life. Even so, every now and then, I would find myself thinking of a memory I thought I had long ago filed away, and pining for a time when the world was special, when it had meaning, and when I was not alone. There once was a clumsy strong, who was acting as a truth be told, a bit odd. She made a bell of committed an evil act, a battle my support to you, God. Heaven Maintenance Team Note, in Limerick form. As I suspected, the balls of light seemed rather pleased that I had decided to agree with them and talk with another being, the one I was apparently supposed to this time. They were very apologetic about the mix-up, and more than a little surprised, as I still protested that I wanted to speak to Edwin again, if only for one last goodbye. This wasn't possible, or so they said but they agreed that it was in my best interest to get cracking straight away on my true life mission with this new partner. They didn't understand the real reason that I wanted to hurry, but without the teleportal machine synchronising us up, time was marching on at such a pace on earth, and then we might not wait for me forever. After half hearing various discussions of the Bella Brat I had been teamed up with, he's really special and grows up to be very important apparently, though our records don't state at what, if you like the human, you will love this one. Not that we're meant to hold opinions like this, but he is far more handsome and intelligent than the one you were leaving behind. Finally, they have agreed to sign me up and take me to another teleportal room, on the other side of a corridor from my room this time. At first I think about pushing them all out, slamming the door, locking it behind me, and putting Enwin's connection number into the machine. But I realise that if we are being spied on, and deliberately kept apart, then what happened before will just happen again. No, I have to be sneaky, but clandestines are good at being sneaky when they need to be. So instead I play along, listen with feigned interest about the history of the Bella Brat and what mine is likely to look like so that it doesn't put me off. Three heads this time, oh lordy. Thankfully I am told that recently there has been a lot of rumours of Bella Brats being talked to from the afterlife circulating around their planet already. So there is a good chance my new partner will be more immediately susceptible to the idea than most headwinds and I don't have to wait weeks for him to come around to the notion of an afterlife and aliens when time is of the essence. Finally they are done, and I am laced up, and, to my shock, but not really my surprise, I notice the familiar alien-looking set of wires sticking out of a machine, something absent from every other teleportal room we have passed, including one that was actually being used by a ginormous frame that filled the room and whom I only got a slight glance of. Well, I think to myself, wondering what will happen. I wonder if this is a good idea. Straight away I feel a familiar stirring in my head, but the surroundings feel different this time, like visiting a place from your past that's essentially the same but has been given a colossal makeover in your absence. Where Enwin's head felt like a jar, this one felt like a cavern, and fittingly seemed to be separated into three different parts. Hello? I called out nervously in the darkness. Hello, I'm Bella Bracker Hooda 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 Fresh Rishi Rishi Grishi Hooda Hoogle with Bella Brack, but you could call me Bobby, said the figure, raising two of the three hats he kept on his three heads. I knew this day would come, but I would be one of the special people who get talking voices in their heads. Nice to meet you, Bobby. I have uh, been sent to talk to you with you, but what I really want is to be talking to someone else. Well, now that's not very nice. We've only just met. I think you'll find me very dashing says Bobby, flashing three pairs of teeth at me. 
I'm sorry, you don't quite understand. Normally I would love to chat, and I will later. But you say I was talking to another person, a human, and we got cut off when my machine broke, so I'm only here temporarily. I think you'll find me much funnier than your friend, Bobby said. I'm far more intelligent. I was in all the top sets at school. I'm going to grow up to be Presidento Brat when I grow. Plus I bet I'm more handsome. Humans are just trouble, and they're ugly, basically shaved monkeys. Look, I'm sure that you're an amazing person, Mr. Bobby, sir. And in other circumstances, I'd love to chat, but, well, I really am rather close to this one already. Then get close to me, baby, says one of the other heads, as a mental arm reaches out and squeezes me around the waist. I am shocked, not so much at the action, but at how quickly this Bella Brat is up to speed about hugging celestial bodies. Sorry about that, says Bobby's main head. Most of my instinct ended up in that part of my body. I sense it's going to get me into trouble when I hit puberty. This head is the charismatic and handsome one. With that, he flashes the big teeth at me again. Despite my sense of urgency, my curiosity gets the better of me. What about that head? I ask about the third. Ah, oh, that one. He's a bit of a mystery. Doesn't say very much. I like to call him my thinking head and say he's a deep thinker. But in truth, I don't actually know what's going on in my head at all. Brain too big to fit inside just one head, you see. This head winks a lazy eye at me, then grins before closing his eyes again. Before we go any further, I suppose you'd like to know all about myself. I was born into very modest circumstances on a field in Jahira, but my teachers noticed my special brilliance and sent me on a scholarship to a major town. There, everybody was so amazed at my prowess and the speed with which I was ahead of my peers, they urged me to become head bellabrat at my university a whole term early. While I was there, I was also appointed to the rowing team, where we won by a record three months, and my middle set of arms was voted sexiest on campus. I also took the hang gliding award, and my presentation on chemicals in the oxygenous atmosphere was broadcast on national television. I was also voted most promising student, most modest student on campus, and best nine legs. All this at such a young age. Who knows what I will manage to do next? No wonder you've been sent to help me. Not that I need much of it, of course. I think, he said, dropping his voice to a conciliatory whisper, that you've been sent here from heaven to help with my confidence. Because between you and me, I'm not as sure of myself as some of a Bella Brat. I surprised him with my reaction to his monologue. I think your telepathic powers might be your greatest gift of all. I've never found another mind so strong in the whole of a galaxy. He sits upright and beams at me with two full heads, while even the third grins a little. Well, it is indeed funny you should say that, as I do rather feel that way myself. Look, I'm desperate. I really need to make contact with someone. Would you try? Just for me. Please. The three heads have a quick consultation. You've charmed me, says Bobby. I can but try. I bet I'll be excellent too. I'm the best at everything. It's no wonder you came to work with me and bask in my glory. What do I say? Hope, my friend, don't you come near, for I don't want you to see this tear. Several nights of endless prayer answered by you standing there. Tell me, friend, for you should know, where else could I ever wish to go? For I can reach the highest skies with such a vision in my eyes. They call it over, but I won't get over you, my four-reef clover, in all that I do. Together we're all that we need. With a vision we can succeed, and that is no lie. With such a vision in my eyes. Come, my friend, I give this night up for you, for all I wanted in the end came true. Several nights of deep despair, answered by you standing there. Stay, my friend, and we'll start on our own, away from before to a world we have sown, for together we will arise, with such a vision in my eyes. Emwyn and Lizzie, the superstar all singing, all dancing, musical on ice, intergalactic tour. I can't tell you how strange it was to hear another voice in my head after being so long without one. It was aching to the man rescued from a desert island who has lost the ability to talk, or the prisoner released from solitary, or the conscience of a politician suddenly waking themselves up at four in the morning after twenty years of taking bribes. I was in the kitchen fixing myself a drink and wondering if ignoring the impending catastrophes being outlined on the news would make them go away or not, 
when I first heard the voice again. It was my first reaction. Certain as I was by now that I had been going mad and had dreamt the whole thing. It was also my second reaction when I realised that the voice in my head wasn't Lizzie. Also ended up being my third reaction when I realised that the shock had caused me to pour not quite boiling water over myself. In shock. Lizzie? I asked hopefully anyway, though I knew the voice wasn't Lizzie's as it bellowed in my ear. It was far too deep for one thing and came with an entirely different accent. Edwin, I really love you, darling. I miss you. I want to make babies with you. I'm stuff, said the voice. Look, I'm paraphrasing, OK? I just improvised on it a little, that's all. Yes, OK, I will try again, but obviously he got the message, because I'm perfect. You can tell he thinks I'm brilliant, and this cute little human wall dance he seems to be doing that involves pouring liquid over himself. Dear Edwin, I'm sorry I didn't get to speak to you till now. I think they blew up the teleporting machine with those wires sticking out of it, and it's all broken, and I was forbidden to talk to you. I am now paired with this rather handsome, dashing, debonair Bella Brat, who's talking on my behalf. What a wonderful mind he has. Why, just the other day? Oh, all right then, back to the script. I hope you didn't think I'd forgotten you, or was in a mood with you. Our love is far too strong for that. I really love you, I miss you, and our nights of hot passionate... Oh, not that part. That was just sent subconsciously by accident. OK, I really miss you, and send you a big kiss. I barely noticed the mental impression of slobber through my excitement. Lizzie, is that really you? You weren't mad at me. No, silly. You are the love of my life. Or at least you were till I met this dashing, handsome... Ow! Look, is it my fault if his voice is all ugly and squeaky compared to mine? Lizzie, I love you too. I've missed you so much. I miss you too, pumpkin cheeks. Your teeth are like stars. They come out at night. Look, I'm just adding things to make what you say basically better, OK? Can you not speak to me directly anymore? It's fatted. Got it in one monkey breath. Some weird machine broke and I couldn't get through to you and they placed me with someone else much greater in every way. How? What did I say? Ah, a light bulb grew above my head. How are you? You are all right. All apart from missing you, honey bunny kissy kissy. I didn't dream you or imagine you. I'm not going mad. I didn't know humans had capacity to dream. Now I'm very much real. I'm quite beautiful if I might say so. How are you? All the better for talking to you. Listen carefully. I think somebody may have been trying to split us up here. Think back on all those times we thought we heard someone still in our heads after all the headweds had gone. And the wires that were sticking out of the teleportal are convinced that they caused the fire that knocked out our machine. I think somebody may be monitoring us even now and might cut the signal short. Wait, what? You didn't tell me that. I'm a good Bella brat, I am. Top of my class and everything. I'm not getting involved with... Oh, well then, if you insist. OK, but why? I interrupt. I think it's all to do with your threat to go to war with us. For reasons I don't quite know yet, I think someone up here wants to start an intergalactic war. Wait, really? Oh man, this is exciting. It's like the movies. Max, I be the hero. Wow, OK. Things are looking really bad down here. They are building missiles right now that are pointing straight at Ziggurus 3. Lizzie, what do we do? I don't quite know, but I'm going to do what I can from up here. If you can do what you can from down there too, I don't know, make people think that blowing up innocent planets is like a really bad idea, maybe we can do something between us. Just remember that if I can't get back in touch with you or we get cut off, I love you. I love you too, with all of my heart. Oh, I love you with both of mine. Right, we had better go or someone will get suspicious. We will try and get word to you. Sir. But I never got to finish my sentence. Someone had clearly been listening in to us and were bursting their way into the door. I apologised to Bobby, thanking him for all he had done and telling him that he was a hero. I knew he'd like that. And turned round to greet the lights as they came in. In the haste though, they didn't use the door, but floated through it. Away from you, said one of the voices. Didn't I tell you she was up to I don't know what you mean, I said, closing the limp to Bobby in case someone asked awkward questions. I was told to use this machine to contact this Bellabra, and that's exactly what I've been doing. Yes, yes but it wasn't what that was right. you were talking to, it was it was the human. Admit it, it was so annoying your own kind of game, and you could warn it was to help the other one. All those lives lost because of one silly kind of response. 
If you check the machine, it will tell you that I have been talking to Bobby the Bellabrad and no one else, I said calmly. I learnt from Enwin that humanity had discovered my planet, but I knew nothing more than that. I worry for my people, but that had nothing to do with me. Given the technology the humans have, they were always going to locate us at some point. If a disembodied ball of light could gnash its teeth, then that's exactly what the lights in front of me would have done right there and then. He knew I was right, but if the other voices play back the teleportal machines, they would see that I was telling the truth. Even if it was only technically true in the last case. One of the voices inspected the last style coordinates on the machine. She is telling the truth. I don't care, said what I had come to think of as the evil voice. They are definitely left to something. Play some of the You know as well as I do, there is no one that can truly shock her up. As balls of light can always pass from the doorway, even if they are locked and put their mind to it. If a disembodied voice could wink, then that is exactly what this one would be doing to me right now. Even so, you can't have a woman around to get through. I'll come quietly, I say, before adding. You have nothing to fear from me, you know. I'm just a lame dead clandestine. What can I possibly do? I don't know where the breeze does go, or how time has just hurried on, but I have seen the ocean smile, at least where I come from. I don't know if the wind will howl, or die in forty years, but the road we are travelling down is not what it appears. I don't know if we can wait for the appearance of another race. No, I couldn't greet another face, not till I have you. I worry for the ones who call next on our great ball. I only hope they'll see a way to be what is needed by all. What would they think of us now, giving fear through nuclear? Why are we bothered with so many minor queries, where there are so many other galaxies? Why do we offend all the creatures we've known, far advanced by the feelings they've shown? A dolphin's power is equal to ours, no wonder the oceans smile. How could we really cope if we had even more or less hope? As the human race falls flat on its face, cut off with a sigh, the oceans cry. I don't really want to see. It's all too much for me. Ocean Smile, intergalactic charity single, raising money for homeless algebraphs. What can you possibly do, Enwin? Lizzie clearly risked a lot to get a message out to you. Come on, think. I asked myself as I sat at my laptop. Just then a pop-up came up on my computer screen. It was a party political broadcast based around a planned missile launch in a year's time. Why saying yes to mass destruction is the right way to go. It was followed by one from the opposition pointing out all the jobs building and maintaining missiles would create. A third promised to save money while sending the missile higher with better weaponry in return for sponsorship on the side as the missile flew up into space stared at by all the cameras. Of course, election time, the people writing, and indeed the people responding to the messages, clearly had no idea of what was really going on, that sending up these missiles in the sky was going to devastate and possibly destroy the lives of millions of innocent beings whose worst crime was to have saved up the precious renewable fuels that we had already plundered. 
we could learn so much and quite possibly borrow so much in return for the technology that I knew well would make the clandestrods lives easier, but without the damage such things had already caused to our own planet. People needed to know these things, and as unqualified as I was, I decided to tell them. I broke my heart out, explaining the story of me and Lizzie over and over as many times as I could. I logged into every political website I could find where the planet I knew as Ziggurus Free was being discussed. I logged into every news article I could find from around the world, translating my message wherever it would go. I created websites of my own called Ban the Missile and various variations on the name. I created my own I'm in the Clandestrod Clan podcast. I created my own forum to answer any questions people had about the arguments our leaders had put forward about how the human race might be destroyed and how it was them and us, effectively, but we hadn't actually asked nicely yet for their help. I made it impossible for anyone who read anything to do with a missile to not read my own viewpoint alongside it too. I wrote what I had to say out compact in replies, going into more and more detail in the works of my own. I wrote of how I had been contacted, what I knew of a society that was about to be destroyed, missing out the parts Lizzie had been critical of. I knew how to write propaganda too. And the fact that if everyone was lucky enough to know a clandestrade the way I did, then these people would love them, not hate them. I wrote of my growing feelings for Lizzie, the way she had brought new hope and love into my life, and that despite the fears everyone on my planet had, she made me a better human in every way. It was very little in the great scheme of things, maybe, but I also knew something about the human race that the renegade balls of light had seemingly missed in their dissection of my planet, and it's often backwards culture. But if you can successfully make people care enough and put out enough of a counterpart to people's arguments, then humanity can be wonderful, a tool for building rather than destroying. I made no pretense that a few messages here and there could solve the problem and pitched me against world leaders with all their money. I knew full well that I was a lone tiny human scrabbling in the shadows of giants. However, even if all I did turned out to be nothing, or well, doing something still felt better than sitting back and watching the home of the love of my life burn. So I wrote, over and over again, even when the electricity went off and cut my messages in half. I am trying to contact on all frequencies. Look, I know it must seem strange to suddenly receive this message out of the blue, but there is a reason for it. Honest, we have to file a report with someone who it will all have been in vain for nothing. Go in, win, I think to myself as the balls of light had aiding, abetting and conspiring an illegal earth resistance to my list of crimes, which have involved contacting an alien race without permission, encouraging a third party alien species to commit similar crimes and tampering with a teleportal machine. We can do this, Enwin, I plead, as I am taken by bodily, lightly, forced to the closest they can find to a prison cell up here, a dusty room tucked away in the corner that had clearly not been used in a long time under the directions of the main ball of light we were set against. Together we are unstoppable, I cry in my mind, as I am thrown inside and warned that there will be guards on the door at all times. Good luck, Enwin, I plead, as I sink onto the floor, aware suddenly of how big the task before us is and how many difficulties we both face because of it. Thank you for waiting for me all that time. I'm so sorry, I sigh, as the hubbub and ruckus finally die down, and I'm left to my own thoughts for the first time in what feels like a lifetime. And thank you, Bobby. Although it is almost imperceptible, I may well be down to my imagination. I have a sensation that I get just the slightest tip of a cap back somewhere in the vast recesses of my mind. Now then, I tell myself, getting back the breath I no longer need to have. How are we going to get out of here then? I paused at the end of my description of everything that had happened to me and Lizzie, not quite sure what to do next. I was well aware of the speed of events down here compared to up there, and figured that I could afford to take the long road. After all, according to the news, the missiles wouldn't be built for another few months yet, perhaps a year, but was even that time long enough? I had hoped for, during my illness and time in bed, 
A major uprising would have grown up against the idea of sending missiles to strangers. Though there were indeed pockets of indignation, most of the criticism seemed to centre on the amount of money that was being spent, and debate about whether the people in power could create these missiles as something a bit cheaper, and which country was providing which amount of parts, rather than who they were aimed at. Predictably, it looked as if the missiles, each of which were to be seen on the news for only a precious few seconds, were to carry the flags of each country in proportion to the size of the funding they had provided, crowned by the logos of two or three big businesses on the side. Quite what they expected to achieve by this was beyond me. Surely these stationary suppliers, gas and shale experts and giant warehouses had no association with nine-tenths of the population who would be tuning in, never mind the victims unaware of what was about to hit them in space. The idea of our world leaders finally getting their act together and working in cooperation just to blow up another species also made me feel sick. Worse than that, though, the whole species changing fact of aliens being discovered have fallen down the news alarmingly, mankind having moved on to the next crisis long ago and having seemingly missed the importance of one of the greatest discoveries of our age in favour of which minor royal was sleeping with whom and which Z-list celeb had been seen on the arms of another. If ever you wanted the human race in a snapshot, I thought to myself bitterly, this was it. The new discoveries that could and should change how we live ignored in favour of something so fleeting, so ephemeral, that nobody would remember or care about it in a few weeks' time. I began to wonder if all the other beings in the galaxy who appeared to hate us were right. But no, I knew my species better than any of them, and I also knew that all it took to pique their interest was, ironically enough given the circumstances, a human interest angle, even when it involved a clandestrod. The reason so many feared this officially unnamed race was because they were new and unknown, though to me of course the clandestrods were as real as any human, perhaps more so after sharing the same brain for so long. All I needed to do was to tell my story, and make everyone else get to know them too. So I did my writing growing bigger and bigger with each retelling as my confidence grew. Enwin's Extraterrestrial Epoch, or EEE for short, was the catchy name of the new website I launched, to complete an absolute silence. Oh Lizzie, I failed you, I mourned, as I stayed up late to watch that stack counter idly took over, one agonising hit rate at a time. Slowly though, very, very, very slowly, things began to change. So I began to do more bit by bit. I added comments to the bottom of every article that even vaguely mentioned aliens. Is there intelligent life in Parliament? Well, no, obviously not. That would be silly. But there is in space. I created a social media account and used it to grab attention every way I could. Scandal. Are the royal family secretly aliens from Ziggurus Free? Well, no, obviously not. They're lizards from another planet altogether. But while you're here, check out this website for the true story. Notice boards for every album that was ever released suddenly seemed right for mentions of clandestrods. Ziggy Stardust spiders weren't from Mars, they were from Ziggurus Free all the time and called Dedalors. Even sport posts weren't free from my spamming. Smash record for amount of goals in a season, but is that because the new striker for Carlisle United is a clandestrod? Everything that made the news, from the latest crisis caused by global warming and pollution, had clandestrods allowed a hole in the ozone layer to grow this big, they would have died out eons ago. To close, is this colour red or yellow? Neither. It's really the mysterious colour roulette, which only clandestrods can see. Eventually, over time, clandestrod and ziggurus free became everyday words, nothing to be feared of, and rather the punchline to jokes, and the more familiar they became, the more they seemed normal, and people felt as if they knew them. Eventually my stack counter began to fly up by the thousands, and even if some of them were secret government spies trying to shut me down, well all to the better, I had copies of everything, and simply uploaded the site again every time it went down, complete with articles on how the truth had been silenced and why. Again and again I typed or spoke out what basically boiled down to this. To all the people who wonder why I risk my own life in saving another world I have never seen, nor ever will, I say this. Who have not seen my home and how little I have left to lose. To all the people who wonder why I risk my own life in saving another that I have only seen in my mind's eye, I say this, that you have not seen Lizzie. 
Thankfully, my hunch had been right. When people actually knew about this stuff, they cared. Along with the insult, go home to your girlfriend's planet. We don't want you, alien lover. If I was a clandestrod, I would stick my fingers up to you with all four hands. You say you're here to help me, and you're the one with voices in your head, right? There came a genuine amount of sympathy and empathy, my species at their best. Nobody, at least no real person who wasn't just following their country's official line, wanted to blow up an intelligent species that everyone suddenly felt as if they knew. The more information got out there about Lizzie and her culture, and her people, the more people began to wonder if blowing up a defenceless planet that had none of the resources humanity needed anyway was quite what they were paying their taxes for. I'd love to think it was my powers of erudition that did it, but really it was people's common sense. All the human race had ever needed to make it do the right thing was a conflicting voice to the official spiel, pointing out why it was wrong and cruel. This was also why I loved being alive at this time. As horrendous as it was to be sitting in a world with several hundred tons of nuclear missiles pointing to different parts of our country and off into space, it was also the time when our ways and means meant that we could talk freely to one another without any of the official channels getting in the way. The public had learnt to be wary of fake news from the official outlets over the past few years and looked increasingly to each other for the truth. And as ridiculous as the truth may have sounded at first, I wondered often what I might have thought flicking past my own comments had I never met Lizzie. It rang more true than the official line that clandestrods were a danger. In truth we humans were the danger, and deep down we all knew it. Before too long, other people were doing my work for me and sharing my website and links far and wide, translating them into every language. There was Lisbeth, the extraterrestre clandestrodi in France, Lazi das Orders Landen in Germany, Elizabeth El Extrangero in Spain. My inbox was full of requests for interviews, all of which had to be conducted via a computer link from my bed or the sofa. I spoke at length about Lizzie, about her race, about our certainty that for all their occasional backwards-looking and regimented structures, the clandestrods meant us no harm at all. I was afraid at first, scared that I would be laughed at for making the whole thing up, or for being mad, or both, and often I was. But to my surprise, a lot of people believed, if only because deep down they wanted a friend out there, not another enemy. That slight feeling of unease that had been buried within my kind at the thought of unfair treatment was only buried by the powers that be in the shallowest of graves and were sitting there waiting, desperate to be let out by somebody. I was an unlikely candidate to be that somebody, but that somehow didn't matter. The earth just needed somebody to show them the right way and they would do the rest. In those few weeks I saw rallies rise up on every part of the sphere we called home and demonstrations in every town where missile parts were being made. Specialists in weaponry and nuclear missiles began to speak doubt about what the effects would be, delivering talks and demonstrations about what exactly the human race was getting into. Economic experts too began to talk about why missiles might not be as cost effective as we might think. It was the mass public who did it really though, and created enough of a mass movement to give these people the confidence to speak. The idea that public opinion or part of it at least, was on their side. It didn't take long before the governments clubbed together to keep news quiet, but we had sympathetic members everywhere now, and we soon learnt where new factories had sprung up to make the weapon parts. I had been very careful to conceal my identity while all this was going on, paranoid that somebody would take me away from my part in all this, and by chance my country's part in the missile was being tested very near to me courtesy of my town's long-forgotten status as a munitions manufacturer. It seemed the perfect place for a rally, so I sent as many messages as I could, asking people to attend there, a mass demonstration of everyone who could and would travel. If Ziggurus III was going to be destroyed, then I wanted them to know somehow that we had at least tried to save them. Most of all, though, I wanted to prove to Lizzie that humanity wasn't all that bad, and that a lot of us did care. Above all, though, perhaps what I really wanted was the reassurance that my kind wasn't as bad as everyone to think, seemed to think they were, and that we weren't still backward apes in suits. What if nobody turned up? I kept thinking to myself. I didn't know the answer to that one, but I had to try. Lives were at stake. Lizzie was counting on me. What was she doing up there, I wondered. It had been months since I had last heard from her via the Bella Brat. 
though I realised that without the teleportal machine on, we were no longer in synchronicity. Still, what could be taking this long? Would all this effort be for nothing? Said, can you hear me? Can't you see that the lights have changed round again? Said, can't you feel me? Now it seems that the nights have changed back again. Spring showers must make their own way from the storm. Sights were just sights, but now mean something more. It's allowing through feelings that I'd never felt before. Said, can you wake me? The catharsis I planned is becoming a battle and, hey, won't you take me? So I won't be damned from rocking chair to the rattle and I wouldn't believe it could ever be so. Couldn't believe I could ever let go of this mask that was never a part of me, no. Now can you see me? Same old faces coming back round again. Said, can you free me? Breaking the barriers of light and then sound again. Where am I going and where am I led? Who will I be when I break out of bed? What have they done and what have they said to me? So, can you hear me? We cannot let them do what they want to the rest. You mustn't fear me. The greatest thinkers of our time, they were all depressed. I see that life has been unfulfilled. We haven't the right bricks with which we can build. A series of changes must be made still. Eurasian Art Musical Song It was a while before my eyes adjusted to the lack of light in the room I was being held in. Not that it was entirely dark. Light still funnelled in from the keyhole, but compared to the full on dazzling rays outside, it was the closest I think I had ever come to being in pitch blackness outside Enwin's house. Slowly though, I sensed rather than saw that the light was falling on a teleportal machine, gathering dust in a cupboard behind me. Enwin, I thought, I'd rush to dial in the code, but to no avail. That route had clearly been cut off for now. Maybe Bobby. No, that had been cut off from me too. Frustrated, I go to sit back on the floor before remembering something. Clearly there was more than one teleporter machine at work up here, given the amount of rooms being used. Where had the other voices we had made contact with come from? I remember them saying that they hadn't been able to track each other down when they wanted to meet up, but I had to try something, and maybe now we were all destined to meet up. I had to hope so anyway, because it was the only idea I had. Not sure of the numbers, I instead dialed randomly on the teleportal, hoping to get a friendly voice I recognised. For what seemed like an age, I got no reply, just a blank screen and an even blanker mind. I had to talk myself out of giving up. What about Enwin, I told myself. He's surely playing his part down there, and for all you know, a month has passed for him. He needs you. Finally, the thing crackled into life. Hello, is that my favourite McGrath calling early? It doesn't feel like you. Did you change your hair or your antlers? No, wait, I see you more clearly now. You grew some extra limbs for our anniversary. How sweet. No, hang on, that doesn't make sense. I'm confused. It's me, Lizzie the Clandersprod, the new girl. That sounds like one of the Habridats. Do you remember we spoke the other night? Yes, it's Hector Hapwood out here. The other night? My dear, that was weeks ago. My growth time. We were all so worried about you. Why did you stop talking? And why are you calling me and not the others? It's a long story and I might get cut off at any time. Listen, do you think you could pass this message on to the others? They separated me from Enwin and locked me in a room. I don't know where I am fully, but it's one they don't use. For heaven's sake, why? Long story. Basically because they think we were plotting to have my home world destroyed, but we are really the ones trying to stop it. Listen, I I think there's a spy in our midst. Have you ever seen wires sticking out of a teleportal machine you use? Or something that doesn't seem to fit? No, of course not. Surely that's a question for the maintenance team. For what? The maintenance team. Just because you're in heaven doesn't mean that everything works perfectly, you know. There is still wear and tear up here. 
You won't have met the maintenance staff yet, I don't think, as they don't do very much, but they come along a couple of times a year or so, the growth time. Are they due any time soon, I ask excitedly, imagining myself being rescued at any moment. Hardly. They came last week. Oh, I said, crushed. You might have met the head of them, though. He's one of the three balls of light that tends to greet newcomers. Ah, is he now? Things were starting to fall into place in my brain at last. Does he have access to all the teleportal machines? Well, yes, everyone does who wants one. There are no locked doors up here. But it wouldn't seem strange if he was to, I don't know, tinker with one. In theory, but why would he want to do that? Right, this all sounds absurd. We're not meant to get involved in each other's lives up here, but to hell with heaven's rules. This sounds serious, and you are my friend. I'm coming to get you. Oh, be careful, Hector, I hissed in alarm. There are guards outside the door. There are what? Well, at least it will make your room a bit easier to find. There are a lot of rooms here, so I'll just look out for the ones with guards outside it. If you can distract them, I think I can slip out. I would be ever so grateful. How about if a whole group of us came and got you? We wouldn't notice one ball of light within so many. Let me call them now. Thank you so much, I say, gratefully. Of course, we had words stick together. Darling, now. Things went silent, my end, as I worked out what to do next. I didn't think that demanding answers from a suspicious voice was going to work somehow. I figured the best thing to do would be to get back into my old teleportal room and see if the wires were still there. They might belong to the technology of one of the races up here, or down there. Everything depended on how quickly they came to rescue me, though, and what Enwin was up to down below. At least my connection to the Habridat hadn't been cut off, though, as I could still feel Hector in the distance, sending a signal out to his friends. It stuck me that perhaps I had been placed in this room deliberately. I knew from the other night that it was unusual for headweds to be put together with others so quickly, and one of the three voices had seemed to be so insistent before, even pushing it before Henwin's head was clearly ready for it. It must have had a reason. Was it so that I could make contact again now? Presumably the ball of light I was beginning to think of as the villain of the piece didn't know about that. I wondered again about predestiny and fate, and after a while like this, the part where my head used to be really hurt. Finally there was a crackle, and Hector was back in my head. Right, listen carefully. There's a Bellabrat, a Camelosian, a Marasian art, a Dewsbury giant, and a Mechion on their way to you now. I'm going to stay put so I can relay messages to each of you in turn in case something happens. Nobody quite knows where you are, but don't worry, we will find you. Wait until they are all there and can congregate outside the door before we make your escape. The first one to find you will relay instructions back to me, and I can send the others there. Once everyone is in place, I can send a message back to you to make your way out. We can also warn you exactly where the guards are so that you don't bump into them and give the game away. Then find your way into the middle of the group, and let's hope we don't see you, or that they can't count. Perfect. Thank you all so much. The least we could do for a friendly clan is Sprod. I always considered you the most noble of races. I'd never heard of you before our first meeting, but now I know that goes for Habridats too. The second wait was even more agonising than the first, and did my anxiety no good at all as I waited to make my escape, straining to hear the sounds of distant conversation. I watched the light slowly fill up the room. It was amazing how much light could come from one small keyhole, and I began to wonder if there wasn't indeed something rather bigger at play here, luring me on. I moved to stand in the light, waiting for my cue, letting it wash all my fright away from me. Courage, Lizzie, I told myself. Look at how much the others are doing. You must play your part along with them. Finally the word came, pounding in my head as if Hector's mind was pulling with Andredolin. Ready. We are standing to the left and centre of the door, so go to your right. Oh, I hope every species is a universal left and right. I squeezed my way through the door as instructed, and found it one of the most peculiar feelings of my life. It was as if the light that made up my body now was transparent, and could mould itself through the doorway, so that our atoms were fused as one as we simultaneously existed for a few fractions of a second. 
I began to think again about the concept of ghosts on my planet. And so I discovered to my shock after asking him on Enwind, and realised that the idea of spirits passing through doors and walls suddenly wasn't far-fetched. Surely it must just have been as balls of light going home. Now it all made sense. Why being here still felt as if I still had a claw on the soil of my own world, even while I was still here. Except, of course, I in turn had a claw in Enwin's world too, and couldn't let him down. I walked my way fully through the door, and to my horror brushed the side of one of the guards. He flinched, but one of the balls of light surrounding him called him back. Oi, look at me when I'm talking to you. It's a simple enough question. Who are you guarding, and why? And what has happened to our friend the clandestron in a human contact? It all seems very suspicious to me. Andy, we can go on strike, you know. You need us. For is it not the truth that the fabric and the future of all space and time would fall apart without us fair to stay in contact with our soilies? Yeah, what she said. That's a very important Bella Brat. I know for a fact that you can't do without me and my contact. Whole worlds will fall apart. Whole universe is destroyed. Do you really want that on your conscience? I was in place by now, and the plan seemed to be going well. Well, chaps, I think it's time we left and went to talk with someone high up about what might be going on. With that, we walked away, all seven of us, the bigger ball of light that must be the Dewsbury Giant hiding me from view. My last email sent, and aware that a government that spent billions upon billions on missiles could spend a few thousands intercepting my messages and tracking me down, I had run out of excuses. I had to go and launch this protest rally at the munitions factory, which seemed like the most logical place to be, and happily for me was only a walk away. There were lots of other people heading there too, I noticed, all of them of course completely unaware that I was the person who'd been writing to them. Some were coming with cameras and broadcasting equipment, some were bringing homemade banners, some were bringing food. I had the easy part, I only had to bring myself. The trouble was, I had been inside my house for a long time now, letting my last job centre funds dwindle and hiding from the surveillance cameras as best I could. The odd food delivery at my door aside, I hadn't seen the sun in months, and with so much writing to do, hadn't walked fully since that time out with Lizzie. This was going to be a struggle, I knew, but what could I do? I couldn't risk the lives of anyone else coming to get me, and I'd worked so hard to stay anonymous throughout all this. Who would have guessed that the munitions factory responsible for such a key part of a missile launch would be in the same town as their biggest saboteur? That seemed almost fated too. I should perhaps have practised this earlier, but I was so busy setting up what everyone else had to do, I had neglected my part. And something else I had been ignoring, all this time writing and concentrating and straining for any signs of Lizzie on the one hand, and government agents on the other had left me exhausted. I had had so much to do, I had been able to stick the pain a little, in a little box in the dark corners of my mind and squirrel it away. But I realised no more. Without a screen to hide behind, I could escape it no longer. I was sick. Really, really sick. Tired, but wired, with a brain trying to think of everything I had to do and zooming at a million miles an hour within a body too worn out to do anything, including sleep. Walking down the hallway, further than I had managed in a week or more, had felt like running a marathon. My body screamed at me for the chance to rest at the same time my brain screamed at me to get moving. Even though the factory was only at the other end of the town, it may as well have been on another planet the way I was feeling. Still, I wasn't going to tell my girlfriend I had let her people burn for the sake of a few more paces. I glanced at my watch. I still had enough time to run a real marathon before I needed to be there. But would even that be enough? I crossed the corner where I had last come back the other way with Lizzie, my head full of love from our trip to the park. It seemed so long ago, especially looking at the streets. There had hardly been a bustling hive of activity when I had left it, but now almost everything that had been opened was shut, and everything that had been shut was decaying rapidly. There was very little movement at all. Barely any cars on the road. I had heard of the petrol shortages, as so much was being siphoned off to aid the construction of the missiles. There were a lot of people, but they seemed different to how I remembered them. Haggard and gaunt, the effects of so much belt tightening and restrictions showing in their prematurely aged faces. The pavements under my feet cracked from lack of care. Buildings around me crumbled dangerously. 
A thick pollutant fog hung around everything, with no industry to speak of, except the incessant crunch of weaponry. For as I wobbled round the corner, I saw the munitions factory loom in the distance, big and black against the gently faded tapestry of sunlight. In contrast to the rest of the town, it was the only place for look used, lived in, almost loved. Unlike the last time I had seen it with Lizzie, a dead husk of scrap metal and broken glass, it was now alive again, and almost seemed to be breathing as smoke poured out of it too, and a constant stream of distant figures went in and out of it like clockwork. Well, there was nothing else to do now except get to it. As I hobbled, though, I got slower and slower, my legs growing weaker with each step. The pain ratcheted its way at my body to the point where I could no longer think, as if a firework had been exploded inside me. I leant on every railing I could find, often puffed to a stop at each step I made, fought the urge to lie down then and there in the street. All of it did no good. I had controlled so much, been in charge of coordinating mass plans, and now it was all for nothing because I had lost control of my own body. I was thwarted here, almost keeling over in the street from exhaustion as the black shape of a factory loomed over me. Still I forced myself on, every step agony to the point where I felt my brain pass out and I was carrying on using automatic pilot, walking in pure agony. My brain banged against the side of my head, desperate to get out, pounding with every step so hard that I feared it would do just that. The effort made me delirious, and I found myself detaching from my body, my soul rising up within my skull, to the point where it was up in the air, looking down on me, walking my body as a puppeteer uses strings. While my mind floated around in the sky, I caught the briefest glimpse of heaven, of a dazzling light I had glimpsed through Lizzie, shining down on me. Oddly, I felt as if something or someone, or maybe a whole group of people were watching me, just as I was watching myself from up here. I felt the afterlife's rays pour down on me, pulsating round the crown of my head and forcing their way around my body, down to my feet. I got a second surge of energy as my soul stampeded back into my worn-out body. How far had I got? A few metres? And so much further to go. I all but wept in frustration. Though I kept it from myself and Lizzie, I knew that I was dying, and now my grave was to be this pavement. I'm so sorry, Lizzie, I gasped as my body finally gives way and sends me to the floor, no longer conscious of anything anymore except the face of the one I loved and had now let down and wouldn't have hurt for the world, any world. With the last of my strength and awareness, I bid not one but two planets goodbye, pausing to reflect ironically on how I was probably the first person from our end of the universe to ever think that. Ingredients a now worm, ration art, polygeda granite nectar from Zigorous Free, gooseberry eggs, three to four, local doozius produce, earth cement, and a cocktail umbrella. Instructions. Put all the ingredients into a big bowl. This represents all the different creatures in this book. Stir the way the rogue ball of light is doing to the characters. Simmer on a low heat the way that Edwin is feeling right now. Add a dash of salt and a layer of icing. Leave to cool, just like the characters in the teleportal room. From the Dewsbury Giant, Enwin and Lizzie, Mammoth Cookbook. Right, Lizzie, you're the boss. Where to now? We really need to find my room with the teleportal and the wires, if it's still there, and find the ball of light in charge of all this. Maybe he can put things right. Let's go, gang. In truth, though, I felt far less sure of myself than I sounded, and was more frightened than anything that all these creatures I barely knew had put their faith in me, when even my own kind had never done that. Even in the midst of all this sadness and misery, though, it still felt good to have a gang. Even the Dewsbury giant who kept getting stuck in the corridors. Unfortunately, I did not feel like a leader. A maze of corridors came and went with no sign of a teleportal machine, and my companions began to get doubtful. And restless. I never realised this place was so big. All I've ever seen till now is my room and my teleportal equipment. It was much easier when we had a voice we could follow. Not to mention when we knew what we were looking for. We could all easily get lost here. What if we never get back to our rooms again? No, this is silly. There has to be a finite number of rooms. 
I think the rooms must have moved. It's the only explanation. Then you must be right, Lizzie. For whatever reason, someone is trying to keep you apart from Edwin. And they seem to have something to do with the maintenance team here. If they can do this and hide rooms from us. As we walked, I could feel morale slipping as we passed corridor after corridor with no sign of success. So, partly in order to keep up morale, but mostly to fill in the silence, I talked with the others about my time with Enwin and explained my situation and how we had been split apart. The others all agreed that it was very suspicious and that nothing like that had ever happened to them. I could tell though that one or two were still prejudiced against the humans, so I explained more about their culture, but there were many good ones too just not the ones who tended to have all the power. I spoke to them about how being with Enwin had opened my eyes to different ideas, and that after meeting him I could see both the strengths and weaknesses of my own kind. I explained that being with Enwin, and being open to seeing life through his eyes, had enabled me to become a better person, but being with all of them had opened my eyes too, that we were working better as a team between us than any of the groups of humans or clandestrods that I knew even though we had nothing in common except our situations, and that while we still had no idea what each other looked like, I still felt as if I knew them all, really well. One corner led us into a fascinating room I had never seen before. Apparently one of my companions, the Marajanard, who called himself Mimosa, had. This is the dispersal room. On rare occasions we can use it to send physical items beyond here, and that of the headways or even our own home planet if we wanted to. Why would you ever need that? Well, we're meant to use it for making ourselves felt from beyond, to give people hope that the soul is indestructible, and offer comfort that we live on forever. Mostly when people use it to play practical jokes. Did you ever have something that went missing, and you couldn't find it anywhere, only for it to turn up somewhere really obvious the next day? That was probably one of us. Wild. That happened to me all the time, and I barely owned anything to begin with. What does this button do? It looks fun. On the switch there were eight different dials that went round and round, with pictures of all the different species on it. The clandestrod one was on the front, and the images looked like a potted history of our planet. Our stone age when there were saber-toothed argebraphs, the lost dark years when different clans battled for top spot of our lands. Our middle period when everyone was wearing wigs and either pretending or forgetting to be civil. The industrial revolution that led us to adapt our caves and set clandestrod on clandestrod while tearing down our clandestrod monarchies. The clandestrod communist uprising and a really long portion of the Tao with a picture of a modern day clandestrod on top that was clearly our current age of enlightenment. Oddly every wheel seemed to have roughly the same pictures in roughly the same order but with different species on each one though some sections were longer with some planets than others. I only seriously glanced at what was obviously the Earth wheel, for instance, which had a ridiculously short modern age segment compared to ours. Well, we've never needed to use it. Apparently this device can also send things back in time. Why would you ever need to do that? Well, the story on Happy Das goes that it used to be used a lot as signs from the heavens and the reproduction of miracles, but there were too many people misusing it and materialising objects they shouldn't have done or trying to appear as false angels, some of them even mating with our species, so it was banned. Did anyone ever tell you about the Antikythera device? No, what was that? An ancient computer sent back to the time of the Earth. Greeks. Somebody got into a lot of trouble with that one. There was a wristwatch accidentally put into the tomb of an ancient Egyptian that was recently dug up too, but uh, I don't know anything about that. Honest. But wouldn't that seriously interfere with time? On any other planet it might, but we always consider humans a bit backward, to be honest. It's like giving technology to your pet. They'll only chew it to pieces, not rule the cosmos with it. I wonder why the machine is unlocked. Usually you have to get special permission to use it. Not that I've ever known anyone who has. It's amazing, I say, studying the machine. Like looking at civilization's baby pictures. Can we send anything to the future? See if my kind survives. Nothing doing, I'm afraid. As even up here it hasn't happened yet. Something complicated to do with free will. Oh. My head falls temporarily. Well, what is this? All oh, that. It's the Renaissance period of the Dewsbury Giants. They look hilarious in wigs. Hilarious, I'm sure, said the Dewsbury Giant crossly. Can we please get on? 
so we went back to our search until finally we turned a corner and found ourselves in the room I had seen on my first arrival, the one with a huge bank of monitors of people praying. This time, though, I got to see the whole room, and it extended for miles, as far as the eye could see, with members of every species on them. Some of them looked like me, some of them looked like Enwin, some of them were tall and slender on two legs with antlers, some of them were on all fours like me, but with fur all over their bodies. Others resembled reptiles, others birds, one race was an overgrown insect. All examples of life were here, on screens with numbers being updated by the second. Taking a closer look at the clandestrod, I looked at what the numbers were. It seemed to be a countdown of things they had done, thoughts they had, and wishes they desired to manifest, but their actions looked like a mad scientist had been using a computer game on fast forward. As I peered closer, I gasped in recognition that one of my tribe, looking a bit greyer around the muzzle, but otherwise near enough the same as the day I had left them. I swiftly calculated in my head that it must have been years of their time since I had died and ended up here, but nothing seemed to have altered at all. The planet was in stasis, unchanged. At least it still existed, though, I thought to myself. The weapons from Earth had clearly not arrived yet. I gasped even louder, though, as the clandestrog got up to move to a different room, the camera somehow following her, as if it was circling above her head. Around me all of my new friends were gathered round monitors too, each one corresponding to their own planet, and each one in the similar state of emotion at seeing life continue around the gaping hole they had left with their own passing. It was fascinating to link what was on the screen with the voices in my head, as it was only the clandestrod humans and bellabrats I recognised. The Dewsbury giants naturally filled the screen, while the habridats turned out to be birds, the Marasian arts the insects, the camelosians the reptilians, the Mechions looked as if they had been built out of wires and technology. The McGrumps were the ones with antlers, and what must have been the Glabdahardits were running around like rodents from Earth. All of life seemed to be here on these screens, each seemingly living their own lives in ignorance and all the other races around them, so far apart were they in their own time and space, but sitting here side by side, centimetres away from each other, on these monitors. After staring back at the rows upon rows of screens, I began to notice that a small handful contained large X's in sticky tape. I asked my companions what they meant, and the McGrumph let out a yell. That's my Camelosian headwet, fast asleep in their hive. Before too long, my other companions found their headweds too, via the tape, and my heart leapt at the idea that Enwin was in this room. But as hard as I tried, I couldn't find him. What I did find, though, was that the humans seemed to dominate the room, with five to ten times the amount of monitors for the humans as everyone else. They truly had a serious problem with overpopulation. One of them caught my eye. They were reading an internet site, and I happened to catch my name. A coincidence, I figured. After all, hadn't Enwin told me it was a fairly common one on Earth. But I found another one doing the same. And another. One of them was actually watching a report about me and Enwin on the news. I yelled at my companions to take a look. Between us, we all found humans on the monitors learning about different parts of my life story. Our meeting, our date, our separation, the sense of impending doom. Parts of my life history were being reported back to me in different speeds, from different chapters, but before too long we had tracked down enough humans to tell the whole story. I was famous. Admittedly, on a planet where nobody knew who I was, with some incredibly unflattering artist representation pictures on some sites and TV broadcasts, but nevertheless, people knew our story. The only question was, where was Enwin? Finally, I caught sight of a factory I knew from my walk with Enwin that was surrounded by thousands of people. They all seemed to be getting restless, as if waiting for someone to turn up. Someone was walking towards it, waving a banner, and was stepping over a figure face down in the road. In an instant, I knew it to be Enwin. I watched as the love of my life was seemingly dead and lifeless, and my heart slept into my mouth. I watched as his world seemed to cry, big cold tears of white that we didn't have on my planet, that fell on everything, including his lifeless body. As I watched people step over him unknowingly, leaving their own marks on this strange new coating, unstopping. The whiteness caught the sun in a whole new way as the rays danced, slowly turning the strange white substance into ice, and then slush. What's happening? I asked, puzzled as I watched. How frustrating not being able to call him. That's Coldrain. 
spent turning into ice, said the Mechion. My planet is the furthest from the sun in our solar system, and we only have one, so the snow is there all the year round. I've never seen it before. Will it be all right? It doesn't look as if the humans have much fur over their bodies. I'm worried he might get hypothermia. If only we could talk to him and keep him conscious. But alas, we can't. We are all blocked from speaking to him, even the soilers. Obviously, we didn't have that word snow on my planet either, given our natural heat, and I was horrified to find out what it was. I willed Edwin to get up and walk, to put things right. I used every bit of strength I had to call into his mind and wake him up. I sent the warmest hugs I could. I prayed for a miracle. But none came. Oh, we were so close. It wasn't fair. I screamed and had to be hushed by my companions, but I couldn't help it. I'd lost everything, for without Enwin, my planet was lost. And yet somehow, without Enwin, I no longer cared if it lived or died. My squeal was clearly enough to let someone know where we, we were where we shouldn't be, and before too long we had been cornered and captured. Quick hide, I yelled, but I knew for a fact that the Dewsbury giant at least couldn't do that. Instead we were rounded up and told we would be separated. Luckily I had the strength of mind to point out that I had coerced everyone else to help me, and that I took full responsibility we seemed to go down well with the ball of light in charge of capturing us. Reluctantly, it seemed, despite the eagerness of his fellow light ball in capturing us. My companions were dispersed back to their own teleporter rooms under armed guard, while I was put back at the same old room, which was mysteriously much closer now, teleporter machine removed, and with the meaner of the three voices locking themselves in with me. So close, and yet so far. So, so very far. In that moment I felt all of the multiple light years I was apart from the one I loved, helpless to do anything, though I would have done anything to reach out and save him. Yet again, I had failed. <laughs>